Oh, here we go. High crash route. Oh, high crash zone even. I can't even read. In this video, I'm going to drive a car along the Great Coast Highway um, here down in um, Victoria, Australia. And I'm going to do it in an Australian car. But it's not quite what you're expecting. For this is an Australian assembled 1974 Toyota Crown. No, to be honest, I hadn't realised they assembled um, crowns here either. Uh, these very distinctive fourth generation crowns really are one of the most peculiar Japanese cars of all time. And they tried selling them everywhere, the UK, America, and uh, this is um, a facelift one been a slightly later um, example. Um, the initial one was kind of the first car to have integrated bumpers. They later added this um, different style that looks more like a separate bumper. But there are crowns all over. It's incredibly fussy styling. We've got side indicators, little side lights down there, main indicators, all very unusual. And presented in a delicious, um, very, very 1970s paint colour as well. So this is a Crown SE. I'm not really sure what the Crown SE had over any other model, um, but I can tell you that um, it has uh, windows and power steering. So um, that's quite advanced. I think it might have central locking as well. I'm not sure it's working on every door, but again, very, very fussy, very, very um, unlike anything else styling. Uh, these um, Crowns were available in um, a fancy coupe and uh, crown custom estate as well but this is the generation before the one that had the twin rear wipers uh, we have a fuel filler flap hidden here and this one runs on lpg as well uh, so it's a nice little touch um, got the victoria plates on it and it's on historic class as well so it's all the good times but i don't think this was even the first generation of crown to be assembled here in australia i think um they did um, the third generation, maybe the second as well, but um, very rare everywhere. Whereas you, you do, you, we're starting to see these at shows now, and I think it is the unusual styling that makes them popular. Um, there is a biplane flying overhead, unexpected, but I did see a sign saying there are Tiger Moth tours here. So I guess what, that's what that is all about. So I'm gonna pause and let that fly over before we have a look at the engine. Under the bonnet, we find the 4M 2.6 litre overhead cam um, engine, chain driven cam. Um, look at that, nice six branch manifold, um, single carburetor. Y you would hope that's a recipe for power, but actually it's only about 108 brake horsepower. So that's not um, very much. If you compare that with the E-Series engine in the Leyland P76, I think that was more like around 120 brake horsepower. So um, yeah, it, it's not a huge amount. This one is running LPG, that's what all this extra pipe work is. Um, it no longer runs on petrol at all, but you can see a brake booster. We've got disc brakes at the front. We've got the electronic ignition from a slightly later Toyota just to boost reliability. <whistles> Quality. Right, let's have a nose around um, the interior then which gets very, very interesting. I mean, for a start off, look at the state of these seats. Uh, they seem oddly sculpted and it feels even more odd when you're sitting on them. It almost looks like they fitted the backrest the wrong way around, especially with a head restraint. Uh, I've got this beautiful sort of print. So if you drive the car topless, you get branded, especially as it's black vinyl. Don't understand why an Australian assembled car would have black vinyl interior. It's insanity. If I jump aboard, uh, the seat is very low and that just took me by surprise again. We've got horn buttons everywhere and I like the fact it's the same button. So it's um, upside down on that side and just pointing up there. Sadly, it's the same tone wherever you press it, which is a bit of a shame. It'd be a lot more fun if it played a different tone for each one, but never mind, you can't have everything. Um, ahead, we've got the dials. Um, there's the um, speedometer there um, and uh, your, your minor worrisome points over there. We've got what used to be a clock, but has been converted by the current owner into a rev counter, which is quite useful. We've got the original um, Crown radio, no longer plugged in, I don't think. I don't think that one's working. And no, no, it would seem not to be working. 
Um, we've got um, some fresh air vents, which are already starting to take the style of what would become very standard um, in Japan, I think. Cigarette lighter there. Quite a long ashtray. I wasn't expecting that to pull out like that. Um, some fresh air vents. There's some switches here you absolutely cannot see from the driving seat because the um, bar of the wheel just gets entirely in the way. So we've got wipers and um, I'm guessing turn for screen wash. Choke, maybe? I don't really know what that one is. I don't think it's the heater fan because we've got a heater fan control there. Unless there's a separate fan um, for the fresh air ventilation, maybe. Um, let's fire it up and um, see. Clink, everything fires into life. Oh yes, so that's a fresh air boost. Uh, we've also got separate fresh air vents down here um, for applying more cold air where required that's all the lpg kit and um, we'll turn that off for now because that's what i loud. and then we've got separate so that must just be for the heater interesting um there's a push button to get the key out and um, we've got hazards down here as well is that a twist or a pull there we go that's a a, a pull switch uh, upside down uh, rear defrost i'm just going to put the ignition on again because um Oh, maybe it's not entirely visible, but there is a very dim light in there. And then we've got um, a light switch, as you'd expect. I'm guessing main beam, yeah, main beam on the column stalk here for the indicator with a flasher. I like the fact you can hear the um, the relays in action. Uh, big pedals down here. Look, disc brake. They're proud of their disc brakes. We've got an umbrella handle um, handbrake here, which if I just put my foot on the brake is not the most convenient to use. That's a bit of a stretch away. Now I'm leaning well out of the seat, um, but nonetheless, it does seem to work. We've got um, what would have been a four-speed gearbox on this car originally, but it's now got a five-speed Toyota Sleeker gearbox. So it's a, effectively a period upgrade. And this is the good thing about Toyota's stuff just bolts in. Change the bell housing, you're well away. There's an aerial button. Maybe I need the ignition on for that. Or maybe it's not fitted anymore. No, we don't seem to be getting an aerial. Um, oh, the aerial's already up, I think, at the back, but it doesn't seem to work. Uh, not to worry, but yeah, a very um, uh, precise little lever. A very narrow gate. The, the difference, that's third and that's fifth. There really isn't very much there, and it goes straight from fourth and very naturally into fifth. Um, there's a remote control down here because the owner has cunningly fitted this um, s stereo under here. That's nice because... It doesn't detract because you can't really see it. Um, little ashtray here. Um, great to put your um, tissues. Uh, it's a useful little thing. Is it? Mm. Right, okay, I'll, I'll worry about that in a minute. Um, but yeah, manual windows. Like I say, I think it's got central locking, but I don't think that one's working. It certainly, that feels like it's attached to a motor. But if I pull the driver's door shut, it locks every door but the um, passenger one, so we think that's probably just something that's broken over the years. It still seems quite advanced to me for the 1970s. Keep fit windows, which take some winding. Um, all at a good time. But yeah, it's not a bad driving position, but the seat does sort of curve away, which is a little peculiar. Um, but And of course, it's a bit sweaty because it's black vinyl. Just notice there's also a little cubby down there. Let's have a quick jump in the back. Well, I can't present, pretend it's great news here. Um, with a seat set for me, uh, leg room is definitely a bit on the tight side. I suppose I could um, wind the seat up a bit. No, apparently I can't wind the seat up. That no, doesn't really want to move. Separate cigarette lighter here and a little ashtray. And uh, how far down do the rear windows go? We always like to know all the way down makes it considerably better than a Chrysler Neon, which is a comparison you weren't expecting, were you? Um, notice I've got a little armrest here as well. Um, yeah, th th this backrest actually feels a little bit too upright, but decent amount of headroom. It's just a bit more cozy than you might expect for what is a big car. But it's worth remembering, this is big by Japanese standards. By Australian standards, a 2.6 litre Saloon is a mere compact, really. Uh, let's have a nose in the boot. 
just noticed we've got these little um, side door markers and um, that's somehow very um, Japanese and uh, not something you'd necessarily expect. Uh, I don't believe we're into the era of remote boot releases yet. So I've got to push the button on the top to get the key out. Clang. Whoa! Oh, I'll just fall over, shall I? Uh, in we go. And we've got my lunch. We've got a spare wheel. Interestingly, a spare wheel and I can see daylight beneath it. Uh, I'll try not to worry about that too much. Uh, but a decent sized boot, even when you've got a huge LPG tank in here. It's a shame this gorgeous little lamp doesn't seem to be working. But yeah, spacious, just very high lip. So I'm surprising you've got a fuel filler down here. Right, um, I think we should probably go for a drive. There we go. The Great Ocean Road. Right, let's drive it. Right, I'm going to start recording the internal camera stuff again because um, I'm going to have to use the um, old head mount. The window mount wasn't working for me. Um, but, uh, handbrake off. Here we go. Get the window done up again. As you can um, see, or hear even, it's not a particularly punchy engine. It's very smooth, but you know, 108 brake horsepower is not a lot. It is a very understressed engine. Some amazing views of um, sea there. But I mean, it's, it's such a smooth engine. Um, I'm not sure I've driven anything with such a smooth engine of this era. It's still on a carburetor. It's uh, remarkable. So uh, an engine tuned very much to be smooth and nice, not um, rorty. Uh, you know, I usually like a six cylinder to be a bit rorty, a bit grrr. This doesn't do that. You will also probably notice that I'm having to fight the steering a bit. It's power steering, it's very light. Not quite Jaguar light, but it's not that far off. So in terms of knowing what the front wheels are doing, I haven't got a clue. Frankly, it doesn't feel like they're even all that attached. Uh, pitch it, she rolls a bit. Um, quite alarmingly, in fact, uh, the Japanese still had a lot to discover about um, handling and uh, the ride isn't brilliant either. It manages to be quite floaty and quite crashy all at the same time. It's not too bad on this nice smooth road, but over potholes and things, it, it really does crash about in a slightly alarming manner. But yeah, the main issue is until I turn the corner, most of the switch gear is entirely hidden from my view. And there just isn't any grunt. Just just about hauling herself up that. My foot was nailed to the floor. So in terms of road manners, if anything, it's a little disappointing. But uh, at the same time, it's probably what I expected. By the 1970s, the Japanese were still learning and they still had a lot to learn. Uh, I don't know if um, Japanese roads are just smoother, so maybe it wasn't until they went out to other markets that they um, discovered just how um, bad their own cars were. I would like to test this down a gravel road, ideally. It might not actually be that bad. It feels very robust, very simple um, car in terms of engineering. But the Toyota Crown didn't get off to a very good start in America. It was the first car they tried to sell there. And it was so feeble, so pathetically feeble, with a tiny little 1.4 litre engine, I think it was, um, that um, Toyota withdrew from the American market and thought, OK, that didn't go well. We shall rethink and come back. And of course, now they dominate. They build pickup trucks in America for America. Uh, they have sussed it out. But they got it so, so wrong. But even here, 2.6 litres to an Australian, is that, that's a tiny engine. That was the entry level engine on a lot of um, the big saloons. Not the top end model, but this is it. You got no bigger than a 2.6. But very easy car to drive. This um, five speed gearbox is um, a delight to use. There's no transmission shunt. 
it pulls remarkably well from very low revs. You know, we're doing 50 kilometers an hour in fourth at the moment, uh, below 2000 revs, and it just pulls smoothly. Uh, so yeah, it's impressive. Some aspects of this car are very, very good. Others somewhat lacking. Um, but you know, the Japanese were learning and they were catching up fast. Wow, this road is um, definitely starting to live up to its name. Unfortunately, most of it seems to be hit by a 60 kilometer an hour speed limit. But maybe that's just fine given this is not the finest handling motor vehicle. Isn't that a lovely indicator noise? Sorry, I do get slightly obsessed with indicator noises, don't I? Right, um... Oh, this must have seemed very underpowered for Australians. Oh, here we go. High crash route, or oh, high crash zone even, I can't even read. Might give us a chance to test the handling of the um, slightly barge-like Toyota Crown. Yeah, the main issue is you've just got no sensation of feedback for the steering at all, not even a hint. Yeah, it's like driving on ice. Oh, and then the body roll sets in. Yeah, I think it's fair to say handling is not this um, car's strong suit. Although actually, if you stick with it, it's um, not too bad. It does grip. <laughs> it's just, yeah, the steering just gives you no confidence in the slightest. Oh, we even get enough tyres squealing there. At um, under 60 kilometres an hour, that's not encouraging. Ah, oh, catching up the dawdlers again. Which is always going to be the problem with something labelled a coast road. Oh dear. It's a nice road, but I'm not sure how it compares with the A487 in Mid Wales uh, between Aberaeron and Aberystwyth. Um, I definitely recommend checking that road out. It can also be very busy like this, unfortunately. That's kind of what this road's all about, really, isn't it? A lot of ocean. Very nice exhaust note. Right. On we go. Let's continue our drive to Lawn. I'm sorry this is turning into a bit of a longer drive, but I thought you might enjoy the scenery, to be honest. So um, hopefully that's working for you. Oh yeah, I think I better stop for some pictures here. Never trust a handbrake. Let's see what views we've got. Nice view of a uh, late Holden Ute there. Very nice. Uh, but yeah, that is um, quite the spot. I really do like the alloy wheels, I think. They suit the car, very period look. Oh yeah, you're looking good. Frankly, I may as well end it there. I'm not going to learn any more from this car by driving it any further. Uh, I apologise for the traffic noise driving past. That's something I try to avoid generally, but pretty hard here on the um, coast road because everyone wants to drive it. But um, thoughts on the Toyota Crown? Um, yeah, I think overall, a fascinating car to drive. 
I mean, the styling I adore. It's just so quirky and odd. Uh, I just can't help falling in love with it. Uh, loud pipes save lives and annoy everyone. Ugh. So uh, it's certainly distinctive and I, I admire it for that. Um, it's certainly not everyone's cup of tea and um, driving dynamics are definitely on the um, slightly woeful side, I would say. It's not its strongest suit, but still, I've had a really nice drive out in it. I've enjoyed that very much. So um, yeah, thanks to the owner for letting me um, have a drive. So I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, I look forward to seeing you in a future video. Farewell.